It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Laura Stein. Laura studies the causes of behavioral plasticity and its consequences on evolutionary patterns. She received her PhD from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where she studied transgenerational plasticity in sticklebacks from a novel perspective, focusing on the effects of fathers on their offspring. Another aspect of her PhD work drew connections between molecular mechanisms underlying juvenile developmental plasticity and transgenerational plasticity using a genome-wide expression approach. In all, her research approach integrates behavioral observations in the lab and field, genomics, and neural mechanism approaches. Laura is currently an NSF postdoctoral fellow at Colorado State University, where she's using these tools to work in a new system, guppies, some of which we'll hear about today in addition to her work in sticklebacks. Based on a photo on her website, I'll also say that Laura has impressive skills in the illustration of fishes and with dry erase markers, nonetheless, which is no easy feat. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Stein. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and I want to thank the committee very much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here and to see all these wonderful talks. So today, as you heard, I'm going to talk a little bit about transgenerational plasticity and how this might affect the colonization of novel environments across a couple of systems, hopefully guppies, if I can get to them. So this it doesn't work, so I'm going to do this. Um, so as we have already spent the morning hearing and talking about phenotypic plasticity is ubiquitous across organisms. Um, we've heard of lots of general examples. So if you raise a plant under the sun versus in cloudy conditions, um, they can produce two different phenotypes, even though they are the same genotype. And similarly, grasshoppers, if you raise them in high densities, they will produce different phenotypes than if they are raised um, in isolated conditions. So if plasticity can allow organisms to persist under new conditions, then plasticity may play a role in the colonization of novel environments. So it's worth thinking about what types of plasticity might be important for colonization and persistence in new environments. So to answer this question, we might think about how individuals gain information about their environment. So for example, here we have a young bird who may or may not experience an environment with hawks, a predator. So in a predator-rich environment, anti-predator phenotypes can be key for reproductive success and offspring survival. So an individual may gain information about their environment via their evolutionary history, for example, a non-plastic response. However, if the environment is fluctuating, producing anti-predator phenotypes may incur fitness costs. You may not be able to grow as big. You may not produce as many offspring. So another way individuals can gain information about their environment is through direct experience or juvenile developmental plasticity. However, in this case, as you might imagine, gaining information about your environment can be extremely costly. You might get eaten. So wouldn't it be great if parents could talk to their offspring, so to speak, and let them know about the environment that they are likely to encounter? If parents can prepare, can prepare offspring for predators, this can increase the offspring's chances of survival. So therefore, transgenerational plasticity, otherwise known as parental effects, are a particularly potent form of plasticity that occurs when the environment experienced by a parent influences offspring phenotypes and may influence adaptation to novel environments. Parental effects is often studied through a maternal lens. So we know that maternal care is important. Within a species, there is lots of variation in maternal care, and this variation can have profound effects on offspring development. We also know that mothers are capable of affecting their offspring prior to birth. So experiences during pregnancy affects offspring development across taxa. As offspring have a direct physical link to their mother, it is fairly easy to imagine how maternal experience can influence offspring. So for example, transfer of hormones into developing embryo via egg yolk or a placenta. Mothers can transmit information about maternal condition or the current environment. Um, and so maternal stressors may also negatively impact offspring development. So maternal care and maternal effects are now becoming more appreciated as generators of phenotypic variation, although there is still quite a bit of controversy surrounding whether or not they are adaptive and whether or not they have long-lasting evolutionary implications. But what about dads? Can they affect offspring in similar ways to mothers? So the biological reality is that most animals have two parents. In many animals, fathers contribute directly to parental care. Many taxa exhibit biparental care, including insects, fish, birds, and of course, mammals. Indeed, 80% of birds and 6% of mammals exhibit biparental care. 
Further, many animals exhibit exclusively paternal care. In fish, of the species that provide care, 50% are exclusively paternal. Fish are the most diverse of the vertebrate taxa and include one of the most extreme examples of paternal-only care, of course, the seahorse, um, in which males of some species even exhibit pseudoplacentas. Yet despite the prevalence of direct paternal care, little is known about whether fathers vary in care provided in the same way that mothers do and how this natural variation is influenced by ecological and evolutionary pre pressures. So today, and the focus of my dissertation, and in general, what I'm really interested in is can plasticity within a generation, parental experience, but whether by fathers or mothers, can this facilitate rapid adaptation, potentially via transgenerational mechanisms? So I began my work by using the three-spine stickleback as a model system. These are an adorable little fish um, in which male stickleback provide exclusive parental care. So males develop these nice blue bodies and red throats. They defend territories, build nests, and females spawn and then, uh, in the nests and then leave forever. Um, so in this way, we can actually separate pre-fertilization maternal effects from post-fertilization paternal effects. Uh, males can have one to three clutches per season, and parental care is absolutely necessary for offspring survival. So under natural conditions, offspring are going to be directly interacting with their father um, throughout their development. And just to show you what some of these behaviors look like and that I will be talking about, I'm going to show you this video to orient you. This is a male, this is his nest. And so some of the parental care that males provide is, if I can get it to start, there it goes. Um, they will poke at the nest, remove debris, dead eggs. They will also fan the eggs. This oxygenates them and clears out carbon dioxide. And then they will also um, adjust the nesting material. I don't know why it slowed down. I apologize. By gluing the nest. So they actually produce this protein called spigen from their kidneys that they will uh, put over the nest while they are parenting. In the field, males must also defend the nest against predators and conspecifics. And they um, are highly aggressive, spend a lot of time doing this. So here is a nest that is being attacked by California roach, a small minnow, and the male is going to come in and vigorously defend his, his babies. He will if the video actually played right. But you can see him chasing, the, chasing them away as best as, as you can. So Stickleback uh, provide an excellent system for examining the evolutionary patterns of parental care. Um, they originated in marine environments and have undergone adaptive radiation in the last 10,000 years. At the end of the last ice age, as um, more freshwater environments became available, they have repeatedly colonized uninhabited freshwater habitats. The marine ancestral form is extant and thought to have remained relatively unchanged. Um, and so we can actually uh, directly compare this marine ancestor to multiple independently derived freshwater populations, many of which are locally adapted. Predation is a strong selective pressure in stickleback, and as they have repeatedly invaded freshwater environments, they have developed predictable morphology and behavior based on predation regime. So in marine environments and in many freshwater environments, we have these fish predators, and, um, where, and we tend to get larger, more robust spines and larger body sizes in environments with fish predators. In freshwater environments with invertebrate predators, such as these odonate larvae, we see, tend to see things like smaller spines. So we can exploit these predictable patterns to examine how parents may prepare offspring for novel predators as they invade new environments. So therefore, the three-spine stickleback system is a nice, unique opportunity to study the causes and consequences of paternal care in an ecological and evolutionary context. So I just will mention, too, that we have found that fathers show behavioral plasticity in paternal care. So what I am showing you here on the uh, y-axis, this is time fanning a nest. And on the x-axis is um, just days after fertilization. If we expose males to a predator, either live or a model in the lab or in the field, at about day four, males uh, reduce, their, uh, reduce their fanning and it remains reduced compared to males that never experienced predation risk across the rest of the nesting cycle. So today I will talk about um, studies that aim to answer these three questions. So does parental experience influence offspring development? So do we see evidence of transgenerational plasticity? Are there shared mechanisms between transgenerational and juvenile developmental plasticity? And can parental experience facilitate rapid adaptation in the stickleback system? 
So to measure whether or not we see uh, transgenerational plasticity in stickleback, we um, de designed this within male um, designed experiment to expose fathers to predation risk. We randomly assigned males to either a predator or a no predator treatment. We allowed him to build a nest. This is the lovely nest. We allowed him to build a nest and spawn with a female. Three days after fertilization, Males in the predator treatment were exposed to a model sculpin. This is a predator that naturally occurs in the uh, river that these fish came from. And what we did was we have a small model predator that is a threat to the um, nest, but not to the father himself. We put this model in and chased him around for two minutes, and then we removed the predator. Males in the no predator treatment, we removed the top of the tank and gently splashed the water. At three days after fertilization, the offspring have not yet developed optic cups, and they are completely covered by nesting material. So that, in conjunction with using a model, means that the uh, embryos themselves are not being exposed to either chemical or visual cues. We then allowed the males to um, parent normally, and five days after the fry hatched, which is when they naturally disperse in the wild in this population, we took males from the predator treatment and assigned them, or no predator treatment, assigned to the predator treatment, and vice versa. And we repeated the, um, the whole experiment. Um, 10 males completed one clutch. Of these, eight completed two clutches. Order was not a factor. Um, one of them that completed them was from predator. One was from no predator originally. Um, and we also did not see any carryover effects in paternal behavior. So if the males saw a predator in their first clutch, that did not affect how they parented in their second clutch. So we raised the offspring in the lab, and we assayed them one year later when they were reproductively mature adults. So just to show you what we might predict, um, in the field, we see these uh, distinct differences between high predation and low predation fish. So for example, fish that come from high predation environments tend to be much smaller. They tend to have worse body conditions, so unless you're really used to looking at sticklebacks, this is not a great picture. But this male is kind of scrawny and emaciated compared to this one. And males from high predation environments also tend to be um, distinctly less colorful and vibrant than males from low predation environments. So this is what we might expect to predict between these two um, situations. So when offspring were adults, I measured basic morphological traits, length, weight, and color in the males. And we also measured some behavior. Um, I'm only going to talk about one of the behaviors we measured today. But we placed them into this assay tank with a grid drawn on the front. After acclimation, we measured a behavior before the predator for three minutes to establish a baseline. Then we introduced the super realistic model <laughs> sculpin, um, and we had it sit on the ground for two minutes and then move around to simulate the sit and wait style of predation risk. And then we removed the predator and measured their behavior after to see if we could measure any recovery. And the behavior I'm going to talk about today is total activity, which is just how many um, squares the fish visited during this time. So the first question, does father exposure to predation risk influence offspring morphology? Most of these graphs are going to look the same, so I'm just going to orient you now. Um, on the x-axis here, on the left, we're going to show the offspring of unexposed fathers. So I apologize, this is going to be very adjective heavy for a little while. And then on the right, offspring of predator exposed fathers. So remember, these offspring themselves have never been exposed to predation risk before. The only experience they have is after they see the model. And on the y-axis here, I'm just going to show offspring length. We can see that offspring of predator-exposed fathers are actually significantly smaller than those of unexposed fathers. We also measure body condition. This dotted line indicates um, above the dotted line, you're kind of heavier for your size. Below, you are kind of scrawny for your size. And we also see that offspring of predator-exposed fathers are in worse condition after one full year. We also found that the male offspring of predator-exposed fathers were less colorful, as we might imagine. And then we wanted to know, what does the behavior look like? So this uh, graph is going to be slightly different. Here we're going to show before predator, during, and after exposure. And in blue are offspring of unexposed fathers, green offspring of predator exposed fathers. And as you can see here, at all three stages, including before the predator even arrives, um, offspring of predator exposed fathers are just less active overall, as we might expect if you are living in a predator-rich environment. 
So um, to summarize, we found that morphology and behavior of offspring of predator-exposed fathers matched what we see in high predation populations. And I should also say that there have been plenty of studies in stickleback that directly expose juveniles to predator cues, and they also matched those uh, results as well. Fathers' experience with predation risk had long-term consequences for offspring. Remember here, we are measuring these as adults. This is one year after they have been parented. Um, and we are see still seeing uh, significant differences in behavior as well as morphology. So to conclude, um, these results suggest that there's evidence for transgenerational plasticity in three-spine stickleback. So that's great. Um, everyone always wants to know how are they doing it. Um, I would like to know that too. Um, some possible mechanisms that uh, we've been thinking about are paternal steroids. So males secrete steroid hormones via their gills. And as you saw in that video, what played of it, their, their face is really close to the nest while they're fanning. And they actually blow water over their gills and over the nest. Um, so it's possible that steroid hormones might be entering the eggs. Paternal odor, so male odor cues are known to influence female offspring imprinting on their fathers. And odor and steroids might also be transferred into the eggs via that spigen when they are gluing those proteins onto the nest. And of course, paternal behavior. So we know that fathers alter their behavior when they are exposed to predation risk, and this altered behavior may act to influence offspring. We have some correlational evidence that males that spent more time at the nest produced offspring that performed stronger anti-predator behavior. And we are currently interested in looking at um, various ways that brain development might be affected, uh, perhaps through epigenetic mechanisms such as small RNAs that might be um, leading these changes. So stay tuned for that. So what we want to know is, after this, is we were like, well, these phenotypes look very similar to, um, so phenotypes of transgenerational plasticity look very similar to phenotypes of juvenile developmental plasticity, um, as well as these just genetically high predation populations. So we want to know, are these phenotypes being produced by similar um, underlying mechanisms? And so what we did was we performed a two by two split clutch design, where we took fathers and we assigned them to either uh, predator exposure or no predator exposure, and we just exposed fathers in the same way as we did before, model predator three days post-fertilization for two minutes. We then split the clutch once they were um, five, five days old, and we randomly assigned them to either a predator exposed or no predator exposed treatment. And at two months of age, juveniles in the predator exposed treatment, we put this model predator into the tank and we chased them around randomly. Um, the time of day was random, um, two minutes, once a day for a week. So they had slightly more chronic, they had more chronic exposure than the, uh, the fathers did. When they were three months of age, so here they're juveniles, they're not adults, we collected whole brains for RNA-seq from all of the treatment groups. And today I'm mostly going to focus on these two um, groups here. So here where the father does not experience uh, risk but his um, offspring does, we call this juvenile developmental plasticity. And when the father experiences risk, but his offspring do not, that's transgenerational plasticity. So what we wanted to know first is, do juvenile developmental plasticity and transgenerational plasticity phenotypes differ? So what I'm showing you here is essentially what you just saw before. We replicated the results of our previous study, which was a huge relief for me. Um, the differences are not quite as pronounced. Keep in mind that these are three-month-old juveniles and not adults. Um, and then when you actually look at the juveniles that were exposed to predation risk, you get this really nice um, demonstration that these phenotypes match ex exceedingly well. And something that might be interesting to note that I would be also, I've been thinking a lot about that I would be interested to talk to people about is there doesn't seem to be an additive effect when they get this sort of double whammy of both their father's experience and their own experience. There seems to be some sort of um, floor effect here. So we want to know, like, do, do, do transgenerational plasticity and juvenile developmental plasticity, hard to say those, share patterns of gene expression? So when we look at the RNA-seq results from the brains, so what I'm showing you here is um, a Venn diagram, and these are the numbers of genes that were unique to transgenerational plasticity, number that were unique to juvenile developmental plasticity, and this number in the middle right here, this is the nice genes that are shared between these two different forms. And it's greater than you would expect by chance, and that's really nice. They share a lot of genes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are doing the same thing. One could, they could be upregulated in one and downregulated in the other. So then we looked at the patterns of regulation for these, and we thought we did something wrong. 
because what I'm showing you here is a heat map. Each line of these, this is a gene, you might be used to looking at heat maps. Red is upregulated, blue is downregulated, and they are remarkably concordant with one another. Um, we analyze this, reanalyze this. Um, so we are pretty excited about this result. Um, it seems to be that, the diff that gene expression in the brain is doing remarkably similar things between transgenerational and juvenile developmental plasticity, even though these cues are exceedingly different. Some genes that may be of interest, um, we found two copies upregulated of SMCHD1, which uh, performs epigenetic regulation of the brain, brain methylation, um, downregulation of TRB3, implicated in regulation of integrated stress response, oops, and MPTX2 um, was upregulated, which is implicated in synaptic plasticity, learning, and memory. So um, we found that phenotypes of predator-exposed offspring matched those of offspring of predator-exposed fathers. Transgenerational plasticity and juvenile developmental plasticity shared similar gene expression patterns, which suggests similar phenotypic plasticity pathways may be co-opting multiple cues. And the mechanisms for actually reaching these um, similarities in gene expression can be a wide variety of different things, and we are um, looking into some of the um, regulatory factors and potentially small RNAs as well um, that might be leading to these similar gene expression patterns. So finally, we know that fathers can influence their offspring. We know that they are doing very similar things in the brain to offspring as, off, as juveniles do themselves when they are directly exposed to novel environments. So finally, we, I wanted to ask, can parental experience facilitate this rapid adaptation of stickleback? So to do this, I collected stickleback from multiple populations in Alaska. I collected uh, populations from two marine, um, the, remember these are the ancestral populations, from three, what I'm going to call new freshwater populations, these are populations that were experimentally seeded um, anywhere from two to 30 years ago. We know the exact age of these, which is really nice. And then four, from what I'm going to call established freshwater populations. These are just populations that, for as long as records have been kept, have had stickleback living in them. We measured all males in freshwater to simulate marine colonization. And on the left here, this is a large marine male fanning his nest next to a smaller derived male fanning his nest. Um, we measured parenting behavior 10 minutes per day, every day of the nesting cycle. When eggs were three days old, instead of introducing a model sculpin, here we introduced a live dragonfly larvae. So this predator is only found in fresh water and has been shown to exert pretty significant selective pressure on stickleback. We introduced it for five minutes and recorded behavior. We tethered the larvae so that it could not actually access and harm the nest. So first, do marine and freshwater populations differ in parenting behavior? These graphs are relatively similar to the other ones. On the left is always going to be marine, intermediate, um, so the new freshwater, and then the established freshwater. We found that, indeed, marine males fanned more and spent more time at the nest, even more so than these, um, interme than these new populations, some of which are only a couple of generations old. We also wanted to know if marine and freshwater males differed in how they reacted to the freshwater predator. And here we have this nice gradient where the marine males are not actually paying that close attention to it, um, but the freshwater males really do not like it being in there, um, with these new populations somewhere in between. And then finally, we wanted to ask if behavioral plasticity differed across marine and freshwater males. So remember, this alteration of paternal care might be influencing offspring developmental trajectories. So what I did here was I calculated the percentage change in the proportion of time fanning when the no novel predator was in the tank. Zero means that there is no change. And the marine males, on average, do not show a change when this novel predator is in the tank, whereas in these established freshwater populations, they are significantly reducing their time fanning with, again, these newer populations somewhere in the middle. However, we want to take a closer look at what this actually meant if these males were just literally doing nothing. So we want to know if males from different populations responded to the predator in the same way. So what I'm showing here is I'm going to show some reaction norms before the predator and while the predator is in with the proportion of time spent fanning the nest. The marine males are kind of all over the place. Um, some of them are increasing their fanning. Whereas for both the newer and the established freshwater populations, they pretty much stop fanning altogether. So, uh, to summarize, we found that marine males differed from freshwater males in parental behaviors even after only a couple of generations. 
The marine males did not overall react to the predator as if it were a threat, and marine males did not alter their, parental, their paternal care dramatically during predator exposure. So not recognizing odonate larvae as a threat and failing to alter parental behavior appropriately can have strong fitness consequences. So it is perhaps not surprising that males from these well-established populations, or even ones that have only been in there for a couple of generations, um, have, are dramatically decreasing their parenting when the predator is present. So further, marine males showed more variation in response to freshwater predator predators, suggesting that ancestral variation in response to this may be providing trajectories on which selection can then act. So taken together, these results suggest that there might be genetic differences among populations in response to invertebrate predation that have the potential to influence offspring phenotypes. Although even if these differences are plastic, they can still be altering their offspring phenotypes. So them, this uh, variation having a genetic basis is actually not necessary um, for the persistence in these novel freshwater environments. So to go back to the original question, can plasticity within a generation, parental experience, facilitate rapid adaptation? So I've shown you that individual fathers plastically adjust their parenting to meet ecological challenges. We have data that they also adjust their uh, parenting in different ways based on levels of competition as well as the amount of females that are available to them. And that a father's experiences during parenting has lifelong consequences for offspring morphology and behavior. Um, changes in offspring's phenotype with father's experience, and the father's experience is from clutch to clutch. So if he saw a predator in his first clutch and not in his second clutch, you can tell those half-siblings apart just by their morphology and behavior. Whether or not these are well-suited or adaptive still needs to be tested, but the patterns are consistent with what we see in high predation populations and juvenile developmental plasticity. And similar pathways between these two may be co-opting multiple cues to arrive at similar phenotypes. And I wanna just also remind you that this is extremely transient. We showed these males, this predator, for two minutes at one point in offspring development, and we are seeing dramatic changes over a year later. When compared across populations, behavioral plasticity in response to predation risk from a freshwater predator increased with increasing population age and thus familiarity with the predator, suggesting that selection has acted on freshwater predator recognition. So more variation in responses in the ancestral population suggests that such trajectories, as I mentioned before, can provide avenues for selection to act that can also have um, cascading influences on offspring development. So can behavioral plasticity and paternal care facilitate a rapid adaptation? These results suggest that fathers from natural populations can transmit information about the current environment to their offspring via very short-term adjustments in paternal behavior, and that this shares, bleh, and that this shapes offspring's developmental trajectories well into adulthood. So altogether, my results suggest that parental behavior might have facilitated the radiation of three-spine sticklebacks by allowing these populations to persist in novel environments and provides a promising framework for the study of plasticity's impacts on evolutionary and ecological processes. And I have just a couple more minutes, so I would like to talk a little bit about some new, oh, I don't? Okay, I don't. So um, I thought I did based on my time here. So I'm going to leave it at that. I have started doing some new studies with this in another system, the uh, Trinidadian guppy, that also has, is remarkably well suited for this, looking at non-behavioral maternal effects. Um, spoiler alert, they show almost the exact same patterns, and I would love to talk about this with anybody who is interested in how this differs between their high and low predation populations. So I'd like to acknowledge everyone and for you for sitting through a talk that went too long, um, and I would be happy to answer any questions um, when I see you out there afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering about the brains of the adult males and whether you did any RNA seq on them and whether you see the same genes light up. Right. So we do. <laughs> so yes, um, we do actually have some data on what the fathers look like, and they also we are currently looking into how these uh, how just transiently seeing a predator will affect. Um, 
gene expression. So, we, so these are baseline levels. These are not after they have seen a predator. So what we're really interested in as well is seeing if transient um, exposure to predation risk shows similar patterns. And I will get back to you on that. Cool. <laughs>